The Wisdom of the Ancients, by Francis Bacon. Chapter 17. Cupid, or an Atom. Explained of the corpuscular philosophy. The particulars related by the poets of Cupid, or love, do not properly agree to the same person, yet they differ only so far, that if the confusion of persons be rejected, the correspondence may hold. They say, that love was the most ancient of all the gods, and existed before everything else, except chaos, which is held coeval therewith. But for chaos, the ancients never paid divine honors, nor gave the title of a god thereto. Love is represented absolutely without progenitor, excepting only that he is said to have proceeded from the egg of Nox, but that himself begot the gods, and all things else on chaos. His attributes are four, viz. 1. Perpetual infancy, 2. Blindness, 3. Nakedness, and 4. Archery. There was also another Cupid, or Love, the youngest son of the gods, born of Venus, and upon him the attributes of the elder are transferred, with some degree of correspondence. Explanation. This fable points at, and enters, the cradle of love seems to be the appetite, or incentive, of the primitive matter, or, to speak more distinctly, the natural motion, or moving principle, of the original corpuscles, or atoms, this being the most ancient and only power that made and wrought all things out of matter. It is absolutely without parent, that is, without cause, for causes are as parents to effects, but this power or efficacy could have no natural cause, for, excepting God, nothing was before it, and therefore it could have no efficient in nature. And as nothing is more inward with nature, it can neither be a genus nor a form, and therefore, whatever it is, it must be somewhat positive, though inexpressible. And if it were possible to conceive its modus and process, yet it could not be known from its cause, as being, next to God, the cause of causes, and itself without a cause. And perhaps we are not to hope that the modus of it should fall, or be comprehended, under human inquiry. Whence it is properly feigned to be the egg of Knox, or laid in. The dark. The divine philosopher declares, that God has made everything beautiful in its season, and has given over the world to our disputes and inquiries, but that man cannot find out the work which God has wrought, from its beginning up to its end. Thus the summary or collective law of nature, or the principle of love, impressed by God upon the original particles of all things, so as to make them attack each other and come together, by the repetition and multiplication whereof all the variety in the universe is produced, can scarce possibly find full admittance into the thoughts of men, though some faint notion may be had thereof. The Greek philosophy is subtle, and busied in discovering the material principles of things, but negligent and languid in discovering the principles of motion, in which the energy and efficacy of every operation consists. And here the Greek philosophers seem perfectly blind and childish, for the opinion of the peripatetics, as to the stimulus of matter, by privation, is little more than words, or rather sound than signification. And they who refer it to God, though they do well therein, yet they do it by a start, and not by proper degrees of assent, for doubtless there is one summary, or capital law, in which nature meets, subordinate to God, viz., the law mentioned in the passage above quoted from Solomon, or the work which God has wrought from its beginning up to its end. Democritus, who farther considered this subject, having first supposed an atom, or corpuscle, of some dimension or figure, attributed thereto an appetite, dire, or first motion simply, and another comparatively, imagining that all things properly tended to the center of the world, those containing more matter falling faster to the center, and thereby removing, and in the shock driving away, such as held less. But this is a slender conceit, and regards too few particulars, for neither the revolutions of the celestial bodies, nor the contractions and expansions of things, can be reduced to this principle. And for the opinion of Epicurus, as to the declination and fortuitous agitation of atoms, this only brings the matter back again to a trifle, and wraps it up in ignorance and night. Cupid is elegantly drawn a perpetual child, for compounds are larger things, and have their periods of age, but the first seeds or atoms of bodies are small, and remain in a perpetual infant state. He is again justly represented naked, as all compounds may properly be said to be dressed and clothed, or to assume a personage, whence nothing remains truly naked, but the original particles of things. The blindness of Cupid, contains a deep allegory, for this same Cupid, love, or appetite of the world, seems to have very little foresight but directs his steps and motions conformably to what he finds next him, as blind men do when they feel out their way, which renders the divine and overruling providence and foresight the more surprising, as by a certain steady law, it brings such a beautiful order and regularity of things out of what seems extremely casual, void of design, and, as it were, really blind. The last attribute of Cupid is archery, viz., 
a virtue or power operating at a distance, for everything that operates at a distance, may seem, as it were, to dart, or shoot with arrows. And whoever allows of atoms in vacuity, necessarily supposes that the virtue of atoms operates at a distance, for without this operation, no motion could be excited, on account of the vacuum interposing, but all things would remain sluggish and unmoved. As to the other Cupid, he is properly said to be the youngest sons of the gods, as his power could not take place before the formation of species, or particular bodies. The description given us of him transfers the allegory to morality, though he still retains some resemblance with the ancient Cupid, for as Venus universally excites the affection of association, and the desire of procreation, her son Cupid applies the affection to individuals, so that the general disposition proceeds from Venus, but the more close sympathy from Cupid. The former depends upon a near approximation of causes, but the latter upon deeper, more necessitating and uncontrollable principles, as if they proceeded from the ancient Cupid, on whom all exquisite sympathies depend. The end.